Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is Great Big History Podcast. And today we talk about the Crusades. The Crusades are a period of time from around 1080 to 1300 or so where Europe, Europeans, left Europe to invade other places, mostly for religious reasons. So in the world of 1000 AD, we've got the breakup of what was the Roman Empire. Western Europe is a mess. It's got the Holy Roman Empire in northern Italy and Germany. It's got a strong Frankish kingdom. Those two are at war. They are, they're, they're descended from two different lines of uh, two two lines from Charlemagne. Um, there's a kingdom in Hungary from the Maiar invasions, Magyar invasions, excuse me. There's an increasingly large kingdom in Poland. Uh, England is divided up into lots of little pieces. Scandinavia, the Vikings are raiding all along the coast. And what we have is two large empires in southeastern Europe. We have what's left of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, uh, after Justinian and the conquests of Basil the Bulgar Slayer, who beat up and then convert uh, the Slavs, the Bulgarians and the Slavs. And we have the uh, Abbasid Caliphate based in Baghdad. We have a Fatimid Caliphate based out of Egypt. We have a third Caliphate based in Spain. And each one of them are highly developed, highly civilized, highly urbanized. And so we have, instead of what used to be the Roman world, the Roman Empire, is now broken into lots and lots and lots of pieces. So what are the Crusades? The Crusades are holy wars to recapture Jerusalem. And there's eight in number, I believe. Though there's a bunch of ones that aren't called Crusades, that kind of are Crusades. And even a couple of the ones at the end don't really want to get to Jerusalem. But the idea is to recapture Jerusalem for Catholicism. Now, why in 1080? I mean, Jerusalem had been conquered back in the 630s by Islamic forces. Or 650s. You know, it, Jerusalem has been an Islamic city for 400 years. Well, it had to do with the... Battle of Manzikert and the defeat of the Byzantines to the Turks. What? So the emperor in the Byzantine emperor is killed in battle. The Eastern Byzantine Empire is now open. The Turks will flood in, changing Asia Minor into Turkey, the modern country of Turkey. <coughs> and there's a, a brief civil war and the Byzantine emperor who wins, Alexis, Alexis Comenus, C-O-M-M-E-N-I-U-S. You could also spell it with a K if you want, but Comenus needs help. He's got a halfway decent infantry army. The best part of the army was slaughtered out there at Manzikert, So, but he can put together a good infantry army, mostly out of people from Southeast Europe, from Serbs, from Slavs, from Greeks. He could put that together. The problem is, is he doesn't have heavy cavalry. He doesn't have knights. Those guys got obliterated at Manzikert, and the Turks took over the lands that produced those men. Especially Armenia, Azerbaijan. Um, the Caucasus regions, Georgia, um, so 
he needs knights. He needs heavy cavalry. And who has heavy cavalry? Who has men on horses wearing armor with a sword or a lance? Western Europe does. And so what Alexis does is look at Western Europe and says, well, who can I call? He's an emperor. So he's looking for one guy who he can hire men from. The problem is, is that Western Europe is so decentralized by feudalism that there's really no one person you could ask. The best he figures is this Pope, the head of the Catholic Church, the head of Christianity in the West. So he calls up the Pope, says, hey, can I buy five to 10,000 knights? Now, the problem with asking the Pope is the Pope doesn't have an army. The Pope is a religious figure. He's got no authority in matters of an army. So he can't sell or hire. He can't give Comenius what he wants. And yet the Turks, who are Muslim, are conquering in and are in danger. And so what the Pope does is say, okay, goes to the French, goes to the Franks, and see, how are you going to get now these guys to go on a 2,000-mile journey that might kill them, where they're going to have to spend a lot of money to fight for a king who's not their king? And how does that help the Pope? And what Urban does is transform it from a go hire yourself out and work for the Byzantine emperor to fight for God and get Jerusalem back. And by the way, and this is point two, you'll get an indulgence. An indulgence is a ticket to heaven. It is, do not pass go, do not collect $200. It is, you get straight in. See, when you die, if you're a Christian, or Catholic especially, but if you're a Christian, when you die, you don't get into heaven. You gotta be judged. You wait on a line at the pearly gates. You can see heaven from the line. And you wait. And then you get up to St. Peter, and St. Peter has a giant book called the Doomsday Book. Because this is the book that, well, when Doomsday happens, we'll have everybody in it. The Doomsday Book. And it has everything you did in your life. Good and bad. Now, if you have more good than bad, you get into heaven. If you're about equal, you stay in limbo. If you have more bad than good, you go to hell. Now, You have to understand something. You are going to heaven. Modern Christian cosmology says God forgives. Nothing you can do is really that bad. You get to go to heaven. Medieval cosmology was the opposite. You are a terrible, horrible, sinful person. And God is awesome. Why would God want to sully his awesome place with you? You lie, you cheat, you steal, you have sex, you think about sex, you think about lying, you think about cheating. Going to church helps, but look at Dante's Inferno. Who goes to hell? Everybody goes to hell for everything because you people are terrible people who do horrible things. That is the medieval notion. You got to spend some time in hell. You got to burn off your sin. You got to repent for what you did. So the question is not, are you going to hell? The question is, how much time are you spending there? Hell, even babies end up in limbo. They don't even get to go to heaven right away. But an indulgence, an indulgence means every bad thing you ever did, everything, is wiped off the map, is crossed out, 
And for warriors, for professional warriors who spend most of their time beating up peasants, taking their money, maybe raping their daughters, this, this is manna. Manna from heaven. This is, you, you are never getting a better deal than this. You know how terrible you are. You know the awful bad stuff you have, you've done. The priests tell you how terrible you are on Sundays. You do not live by the Beatitudes. And so the indulgence for warriors is huge. You mean I get to go on a trip and I get to beat people up. I get to be a soldier. And I get to go to heaven for that. And that brings us to three. Who is going to be attracted to this? Violent guys. Religious guys are going to be, and violent guys are going to be. It is a violent outlet for those without land title or money. If you're like some second cousin of the Lord, you're not looking at inheriting anything. You got the name. You're Buford. Okay. But you're now poor gentry. You don't really matter. You're not a peasant, and that's nice. But you're not getting glory. You're not getting honor. You're not going to sit at the round table with the other knights. You're nobody. But now you have the chance because we're going to carve out entire new territories, entire new countries. You could become the Duke of Antioch. You can become anything. You could become the King of Jerusalem. Why not? So for guys who were violent and for guys who don't have much to lose and for guys who don't want to go to hell, this, the Crusades had the perfect motivation to go. And so what we get is an, is an exhalation. Just Europe is going to give up People, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are going to head east into the Middle East. Interestingly, not many Spanish. Not many Spanish knights go. French, lots. English, some. It's hard to get from there from England. German, plenty. But especially Southern French are going to go. Italians, sure, why not? They're going to be mostly merchants, but some will go. But not Spanish. Why? Well, because Spanish knights are fighting in Spain versus the caliphate there against the, the Almoravids, which we talked about when we did Africa a bit. They control Morocco and Spain, at least half of Spain by 1000 AD. And so the Spanish are very haughty about this. You know, uh, you would go to the Spanish knights and say, let's go on crusade. You should go on crusade. And the Spanish knights would say, we are always on crusade in Spain. Well, good for you then. You just keep on trucking. Thanks. But that was the attitude that the war, the Re Conquista, R-E-C-O-N-Q-U-I-S-T-A, the Re Conquista, the Catholic Reconquest of Spain, was itself a crusade. It wasn't called a crusade, but it had all the earmarks of one. It was a war against the Muslims. It was a war of a Catholic state or Catholic states against an Islamic one. It had religious overtones to it. It had all the markings. And I, I, it probably occasionally they get turned into crusades, but that's, I'm not enough of a, and I don't know enough about early medieval Spanish pay, Vatican alliances to know but i'm sure some spanish or um pope came along and said all right your war uh for cordoba will be a crusade and you know i'm sure it's happened so the first crusade the first crusade works now, that's much to the, the dislike 
of the Byzantine Emperor of Alexis. I mean, it's nice that it worked, but it didn't do what it was supposed to do. What it was supposed to do was smash the Turks. This beat up the Turks and then left and then went into the Middle East, went into what we call the Levant, L-E-V-A-N-T, Syria, Lebanon, then Palestine. And it worked. Why? Because for the most part, the Muslims had never fought anybody like this before. Not in the Middle East. Giant men in a tin can in, in, on a horse. They were used to fighting men swift, lightly armored, lightly armed horse troops. In come these guys. How do you kill them? The famous scimitar doesn't work against armor. The scimitar is a cutting. It's like a deli slicer. If you're wearing cloth, you're wearing leather, sure, it'll cut right through that. You're wearing plate or chain? It doesn't work. So the Crusaders had the ability to kill without being killed if they didn't do anything stupid, if they didn't get stuck in a trap, if they didn't go walking off into the desert and get surrounded. And the First Crusade doesn't. It captures Jerusalem, but the sack of Jerusalem is so violent, it murders everybody, Jews, Muslims, fellow Christians. It was a city maybe of 20 or 30,000 people. It's emptied. The stories that people write about the sack of Jerusalem at the time, blood covering, flowing like rivers through the streets, butchering entire families in their homes and then claiming it for yours. And then going to church in blood-stained armor. The Byzantines and the Arabs did not fight wars this way. This was totally new. And this was totally toxic. It, it showed that religion could be a motivating factor, yes, but it was also a devastatingly violent act as well. Um... The sack of Jerusalem is also going to be the black stain on the Crusaders. It's going to be the proof for Muslims that we have to kick these guys out, that Christians are, or at least Catholics are uncivilized, that they're the barbarians. They're the violent ones. What the First Crusade will do is carve out four Crusader states, Catholic, independent states tied to Italy or France. Not to the Byzantine Emperor. They are not loyal to the Byzantine Emperor. They're tied economically back to Italy. They're tied really politically back to the King of France. A lot of these guys are French. Which upsets the Byzantine Emperor because he was expecting this to help him. Instead, he's tied to a bunch of brutes he doesn't control. With the added problem that he's still got the Turks to deal with. Well, this is going to cause a response. The Muslims have to respond. Not only did their kingdom get invaded, not only did a caliphate get invaded, but citizens got butchered. No caliph of the true faith could accept this at all from any people of the book. It's way too violent way too destructive. And so the one that they'll capture is Edessa, E-D-E-S-S-A. That's up on the upper Euphrates. And the reason it's captured first is it's the closest to Baghdad. It's the easiest to get to. It's on the Caliph side of the Euphrates. So it was, it was stupid to kind of have taken it. It was done for political, not military or economic reasons. Um, the Norman Knights who are French, but by, by these guys had actually conquered Sicily, creating the kingdom of the two Sicilies, Napoli and Sicily. They'll be the guys who created Dessa. And they didn't want to be told what to do by any of the other guys. And so they said, well, we'll just conquer ourselves a king, a kingdom. And so they marched across the Euphrates, conquered the city of Edessa and said, Poop, we got a kingdom. It's ours. The problem with Edessa is no one could defend it. 
The Byzantines couldn't help you out. It was across the Tarsus Mountains. It was too far away from Antioch. It was too far away from the sea, from Italy. It couldn't get reinforcements. And it was vulnerable to Baghdad. And eventually an army marched up and smashed it. So the conquest of Edessa causes a second crusade. We have to get this kingdom back. There's a second call for a crusade and a second crusade goes. This one, I think, has Louis IX, the king of France, on it. And it is a total disaster. It is a failure. It doesn't get... It, it tries to march across um, Asia Minor again and it fails. It, it runs into the Turks, decides to fight the Turks and is a disaster. It fails. Louis goes back to goes back to Europe where his his wife is so kind of humiliated by him that she refuses to uh, have adult relations with him until he um, redeems himself. He redeems his honor. So he'll set off on a crusade, another crusade that will be itself a complete failure and he'll get killed while on this crusade. It's, it's not one of our canonical ones. He basically goes out to reclaim his honor and fails, gets crushed. Um, so the second crusade is a failure. All of this gives rise to a guy called Saladin. Saladin is the great hero of the Islamic resurgence. He's a Kurd. He's not an Arab. And what he will do is unify Iraq, Baghdad, and Egypt in order to counter the Crusaders. Now, he had a general, Nur ad-Din, who was his mentor, who actually went a long way in doing this, but he will put the finishing touches on the reconquest, the reunification of Baghdad and Egypt. And that meant trouble. And that means trouble for Jerusalem. The goal for is Jerusalem. And what Saladin does is lure um, a pretender king of Jerusalem into a battle. Now I say the pretender king because the the guy is King Gi, G U Y guy, but call him Gi. But he himself was married to the sister of the previous king, Baldwin, Baldwin the Fourth who died of leprosy, died a terrible death of leprosy. But Baldwin IV, before he died, was the only king able to actually defeat Saladin. The Crusader states had what we call interior lines. They had the coast. They had the sea. They could bring in supplies from Italy. They could bring in reinforcements from France. So as long as you didn't march off into the desert and get surrounded and get crushed because you had much smaller numbers, you could win. You controlled the water. You controlled the water supplies because you controlled Jerusalem. So the idea was you played defense and you parried, P-A-R-R-I-E-D, you parried. And Saladin had trouble with that. Saladin was in a lot of trouble because he looked like a failure. He couldn't get it. His goal was, I should have the power his legitimacy was based on, I can get back to Jerusalem. If he can't get Jerusalem, he's going to lose command because he's not an Arab. He's a Kurd. He's a minority. He needs success. Well, Baldwin dies. Guy marries the sister. Guy gets elected king of Jerusalem. Guy has that problem. He needs a win. He's a pretender. The only reason he's king is because he's married to a girl. So he needs to get these manly man knights to accept him as king, to follow him as king. So he needs a battlefield victory. And so that's the Battle of Hatton Heights in 1187. He goes marching off to go fight Saladin, to win a grand battle. And Saladin lures him into a trap across a desert. Saladin's army takes an oasis where it will have plenty of water, which meant Guy's army 
had no access to water. So it's 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 trapped in the desert. It's dying. Remember, these guys are in metal armor, so they have no water. So when they get to Saladin's army at this at this oasis, what Saladin does is give up the water, give up the oasis. Guy's men see this water. They go charging in. They're like, oh my God, I got some water. I get some water. They go charging in. And what Saladin does is surround, take his army and go both ways and surround the oasis. Great. You can have the water. You're now trapped. What follows is a complete destruction of the king of Jerusalem's, of Guy's army. Some of the men will get out. They'll escape. Uh, a bunch of knights, a hundred knights or so, uh, go charging at what they think is the thinnest part of the line. And what that part does is just open up. Let them through. They go charging through and then the, the lines close again. Hey, these guys want to fight? Okay. We don't want to fight you. You go right ahead. Which meant now Guy's army was short a hundred knights the best knights, the guys who really wanted the fight, they're now on the other side of the army, completely outnumbered. They have nothing to do. They have no water. So what they go is go back to Jerusalem. They leave. Guy's army is destroyed. Guy is captured. Now without an army protecting Jerusalem, Saladin can lay siege to the city. He lays siege to the city, breaks through the walls, captures it. If you ever watched the movie Kingdom of Heaven, this is all played out. Uh, this is this is one of those scenes in history that movies didn't happen. Movies didn't kind of deal with. And this is um, with it has Orlando Bloom in it. And it's it's a decent movie. I, I enjoyed it. But it's a piece of history that's usually not covered. And um, in the end, the fighting, there's a negotiation and it's this kingdom. The city is taken, but it's not sacked. We are not like the Catholics. We are not like the Knights who killed everybody. We will capture the city, but we will not murder everybody. So it's the victory over the kingdom of Jerusalem. Not of the kingdom of Jerusalem, over the kingdom of Jerusalem. They recapture Jerusalem, and what Saladin does is make Jerusalem a holy city. Jerusalem wasn't really a holy city. It was just one of many cities. Mecca and Medina are the holy cities. It is the act of reconquering it from the Christians, the act of getting it back, the fact that the Christians cared about it, that will make it a holy city. And we'll get the Dome of the Rock Mosque, which had been there before, but now it's going to become spectacular. And we are going, and what Saladin and future caliphs are going to do is create Jerusalem as an Islamic center. Islamic city, the third city. Now, remember, that only lasts until the Turks win. The Turks make Constantinople, Istanbul, an Islamic center. The Turks don't really care about is about Jerusalem. It's a city out in the middle of a desert, out in the middle of nowhere. We can retcon that Muhammad went there, but it's not really dealt with. It's not important. Mecca and Medina are the important cities. But the idea that Jerusalem is a Muslim city and that it should remain a Muslim city and should be a high holy city with lots of, um, that it should be an Islamic center is born in these Middle Ages out of the Crusades. Saladin proves more civilized than the Europeans. In fact, the stories of Saladin are all about how civilized he's are, he, are, he is. He's more civilized than the Christians. And that's the Christians writing about him. And in this way, this goes back to Tacitus. This goes back to the Romans. The idea that you praise your enemy. Tacitus in his Germania, when he writes about the Germans, talks about how the Germans are free and they're, they're happy and they're great and they're strong. In order to show, without saying it, all the problems of Rome. See, you can't say to the Roman emperor, you suck. Look at all the things you're doing wrong. You can't do that. That's how you lose your head. 
So what you do is you say, look at these barbarians. They're better than us. Why are they better than us? Well, they're free. They choose their own leaders. They, and you say things that are analogies without having to actually insult Rome. And so what Europeans did was say, look at Saladin. He is so much better than our kings. He is so much more chivalrous than our knights. He's so much more honorable than our crusaders as a way of showing the violence of medieval society, of the failings of medieval society. The conquest of Jerusalem by Saladin causes the third crusade. Immediately, the, the bells ring out. This is the crusade of the three kings. Everybody who's anybody wants to be on this. This is the all-star crusade. The kings of England, France, and Germany are on the move. And it's a failure. Why is it a failure? Because all of these kings had beefs with each other. The emperor in Germany did not get along with the king of France. The king of France did not get along with the king of England. In fact, the king of England was the vassal of the king of France. The king of England is supposed to do what the king of France says. But the king of England is Richard the Lionheart. Richard I, the manliest man in all of Europe. He ain't taking orders from nobody. And so the kings fought with each other instead of fighting Saladin. And then they took their beefs back home. Richard and Philip will get into a fight. Richard's the king of England. Philip is the king of France. They'll get into a fight and Richard will beat the beep out of him. And Philip will do what any boy with the only bat, with a basketball on the court does. He takes his ball and goes home. And then what he does, he invades Richard's lands. That happened to be in northern France, of what we call northern France, Normandy. But he invades England's uh, lands, which means Richard has to go back. He can't capture Jerusalem. He's got to go back and defend England. From his, from his one-time ally, now his rival, Philip. So this is a giant mess. Oh, the king of the emperor of Germany? That's Frederick Barbarossa. Which I believe is means red bearded. Barbarossa. Um, you may have heard of Barbarossa because that's the name for the invasion of Russia by the Nazis during World War II. Operation Barbarossa. Barbarossa was probably the best king. He had the best army. He had been king for 20 odd years, emperor for some 20 odd years. He beats up lots of people. He's good at this. The problem is he died. He drowned in a river in Asia Minor. An angry turtle upset his horse. He got thrown off. He was in armor. And so if you want to invade Jerusalem... Be careful of angry turtles. So he dies a an ignominious death. His army immediately breaks up and goes back to Germany to go fight among themselves in a civil war, and because different dukes want to be the new emperor, and so the, everyone took their beefs with them. In a way, the Crusades were supposed to be. I don't. I, I doubt they thought of it this way. They they couldn't have thought of it this way. But I think of it this way. People whose marriage is in trouble. Many times, and I've seen it myself. I've seen couples who I've known do this. Their marriage is in trouble. They're fighting. They got stress, and they're like, "Look, what if we just take a vacation?" We'll go for 10 days to Cancun. We'll just get, maybe it's the place. It's the stress. It's the job. What if we just decompress and find the love again? We're married. We must have liked each other at some point. What if we just get out of town? And, and it will rekindle the spark. We won't have the stress. We'll get back together. 
And I think that's what the Pope wanted. He wanted all of these kings who all fight each other to like, go to the Middle East, go fight an enemy. You'll be united. The enemy of my enemy is, is, is my friend or the, the friend against my enemy is my friend, uh, you know, something like that. And the idea was go to the Middle East, beat up some people, beat up some Muslims and realize you have more in common. And so you'll come back to Europe and not fight each other anymore. You'll be like, oh, remember when we had a great time and you'll find the love again, again. If you have seen this, maybe you've seen something different, but I've seen it and it's never worked. And the reason it's never worked is because of the third crusade, because they don't leave their problems back home. They take them with them on that vacation. So they go to Cancun and they fight about the kids. They fight about work. They fight about stress in Cancun. That no matter where they go, there they are. They can't leave their problems behind. And so they can't find the relationship they had before they had problems. And that is England and that is France and that is Germany. They can't do it. They go to the Middle East and they come home and they get divorced. They break up. They fight even more. Because now you know the Hail Mary didn't even work. So why even try it? That leads us to our fourth crusade in 1204, which is the last one we're going to talk about because it's the last one that really matters. The fourth crusade in 1204 doesn't even go to Jerusalem, doesn't even get there. It sacks Constantinople. The Duke of Venice used it, used his ships, used it to attack his economic rival, the emperor of Constantinople, the emperor of the Byzantine Empire. And the, the crusade gets sucked into a Byzantine civil war, or uh, uh, not so much a civil war as a dynastic dis dispute. So it's on its way to Jerusalem. It stops off in Greece on its way. And in Greece, they run into, the crusade runs into a um, Byzantine prince who got, got kicked off the throne. And the Byzantine prince says, hey, guys, if you help me get back on the throne, I will give you a gazillion dollars. Now, I know gazillion dollars are made up. I know there's no such thing as a gazillion dollars. But you have to understand, this is 1200 in medieval Europe. The Byzantine Empire, for all that it was known for, was known to be rich. The Byzantine Emperor was known to be rich. He was the richest man in Christendom. He may be lazy. He may be a drunkard. He was a weird Orthodox Christian, which we weren't really sure is a Christian anymore, but they celebrate Christmas on the wrong day. They celebrate Easter on the wrong day. It's a little weird, but at least they like Jesus. So, eh. but he's wealthy. And so when he says, I'll give you a gazillion dollars, well, hell, maybe he's got a gazillion dollars. I don't know. We don't exactly have the Forbes 500 list telling us who the richest guys in the world are. So when a guy says, look, I'm the Byzantine emperor or the ex-Byzantine emperor, if you put me back on the throne, I'll give you a gazillion dollars. You say, sure. And so that's what happens. The Crusaders lay siege to, to Constantinople. The current emperor, who was a wuss, flees. The crusaders break into the city. And they put this dude on the throne. And the guy sits on the throne, he puts on his purple cloak and says, Ah, I'm the emperor again. That's great. And the crusaders look at him and say, Okay, where's our gazillion dollars? And the Byzantine emperor goes, the new Byzantine emperor goes, Dude, I made that up. There's no such thing as a gazillion dollars. I didn't think this would work. Are you crazy? Of course I promise you a lot. I'll give you some money. How about I give you each uh, like 600 bucks? And the Crusaders look at each other and go, you promise a gazillion dollars. 
and uh, and we're going to get what you promised. And the Byzantine emperor goes, I don't have it. He also doesn't have an army to defend himself. The entire city is taken over by the crusaders. And the Duke of Venice is like, you know, if we just burn this place down, I get all the money. I get all the trade from the Middle East. None of it would go to Constantinople. It would come right to Venice. So I'm okay if we want to, if you guys want to burn it down, I'm okay with that. And the business owner is like, dude, like literally, like look in a dictionary. Gazillion is made up. Like I'll give you money, but it doesn't exist. And the crusaders say, yeah, well, we're taking our gazillion dollars. And what they do is loot everything that's worth anything in Constantinople. At gold frames in pictures of pictures. They melt down. They take every, they loot every house and put it all in the giant racetrack, the hippodrome, and pile it up and melt it down and turn it into coins. There, I don't think there has been a looting of a city so systematic, so complete since what the Greeks did at Persepolis. Or the Greeks did to the Persian Empire. I mean, I, I can't say that. The Romans were systematic as all heck. I mean, the Romans sacking Carthage probably did this. So, pro so probably goes back to that, to Carthage. But the amount of money that is looted, that it's a thousand years of wealth, of culture, books, anything, is just taken from the city. It's just looted. And what was the justification? That Orthodox Christians are not real Christians. Because remember, the crusade was for Christianity. Well, the idea is these Orthodox guys, they're not real Christians. Catholics are Christian. You people aren't. And what this does is crack Europe in half. It cracks Europe between a Catholic West and a Orthodox East. And that, that is still the line between Western and Eastern Europe. Make no mistake, that's the line more or less during the Cold War. That's the line now. When someone talks about Eastern Europe, they are talking about the Orthodox Slavic East versus the Germanic-speaking or Latin-speaking Catholic West. Now, you may go, whoa, wait, 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 whoa, 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 uh, I'm a Protestant. Yeah, that means you're a protester to Catholicism. You're Catholic. That changed. Uh, I had a professor in college who was... Lutheran and she was a Russian historian and she loved to tell the story of how she was doing research when she was uh, in, during the Soviet Union she was doing research back in the 70s and an old woman an old grandmother she was having dinner with this old old grandmother with his family and there was the grandmother who said oh what church do you go to dear and she goes well I'm, I'm Lutheran and the grandmother asked, what does it feel like to be a heretic of a heretic? To be so wrong. Because the Orthodox are the true faith, and the Catholics broke away from the Orthodox. But the Protestants broke away from the Catholics, so they're doubly wrong. If the Catholics are wrong, Protestants are doubly wrong. They're further away from Orthodox. But that division, which starts around in, in the 700s, is irredeemable after 1204. The two sides don't even talk to each other. I mean, except maybe in the most recent of recent pasts, has the, has the Pope and a patriarch talk to each other. What this does is weaken the Byzantine Empire. I mean, this is fatal to the Byzantine Empire. With no money, they can buy no armies. With no armies, they can't defend themselves from the Turks. And in 1453, the Turks take Constantinople and they burst into Southeastern Europe. I mean, they actually burst into Southeastern Europe in the 1300s, smash the Serbs, smash the Bulgarians, take over Southeastern Europe, then turn and capture Drew, uh, Constantinople. And in 1453, the last vestige of the Roman Empire on earth 
is extinguished by the cannons of the Turks. And they were left, Constantinople was left to be captured by the Muslims by the Catholic West. The Germans, the Italians, the French didn't come to their help. They didn't care. Western Europe was modern and this Byzantine thing, this Orthodox thing, that was medieval. That was the past. So we didn't care. So what are our results? First, Islamic states convert non-Muslims. They hadn't been doing that before because Muslims weren't expected to pay taxes. But non-Muslims could stay non-Muslims if they paid a tax. A head tax, a religious tax. And so there's not a lot of conversion. Elites convert in order to remain elites. But for the most part, most people don't convert. The peasantry doesn't convert. There was maybe the hope that the Byzantine king would come back and help them. But there was also the idea that we didn't have to. You paid your tax and you got to go to church. Okay, this is not a big deal. This wasn't a problem. Afterwards, the caliphates are going to convert. You, you have to become Muslim. Why? Because they were worried the crusaders would come back. And they didn't want a fifth column. They didn't want there to be Christians in the Middle East that could help them. So the idea is now you have to convert. You can't stay a Christian anymore. And the Middle East goes from 85% Christian to 2% Christian. Now, the thing that helps that happens is that basically the Christians of the Middle East looked at the failure of the Crusades and said, made a bet. And their bet was the Byzantine Empire is collapsing. The Europeans have been kicked out. After 1300, 1350, they've been kicked out. They're not coming back. So I might as well make the best deal I can. And in the early stages, it's going to be a good deal. The caliphate wants people to convert. It doesn't want to have to force them. It doesn't want to have cut heads off of people. It doesn't want to do all these things. So it's going to give a good deal. If you become a Muslim, boom, you'll get these privileges. If you don't and you wait, we're going to start taking privileges away. This is how prisons work, right? This is the, the Stanford prison experiment. This is, this is the prisoner uh, debate, negotiation. Do I give in now when I can get the best deal? Or do I wait but hope nobody else gives in either? So the Islamic, the Middle East becomes Islamic. Not just the elites will be Muslim, but the peoples, the merchant, the merchant class will go Islamic first, and then the peasantry. Second, we get the rise of three major states, Islamic states, Baghdad, Egypt, and the Turks. Baghdad is based on Baghdad. Egypt is based on the Nile in Egypt. The Turks will be based in Asia Minor. And then after 1453, Constantinople. The idea was states had to organize and modernize to beat the Crusaders. Now, I know I told you about Saladin and how he united Baghdad and Egypt, but what will happen is Genghis Khan will show up. The Mongols will show up and smash in 1258, absolutely smash Baghdad. And that will crack Egypt and Baghdad into pieces again. But the idea was to beat the Crusaders, you had to modernize. You had to create a state. You couldn't just be an old school caliphate. It now had to be more modern. It had to be able to get armies, get money, be able to compete. Compete for ideas. That's Saladin making Jerusalem a holy city. Had to compete with ideas. And so you get these big three. And, and these big three have been the big three since Babylon. It was Babylon, Egypt, and the Hittites. The Hittites get replaced by the Assyrians, Egypt, Babylon. You get the Persians. 
and it's Persia, Greece, Egypt. Then you got the the Macedonians who conquer everything. Alexander conquers everything, and then his empire splits up. And how does it split up into Antioch, Egypt, and Greece? So this triangle of the Middle East has existed for as long as as long as there have been an Egypt, a, a Babylon, and a Asia Minor since 4000 BC or so. So it's not a surprise that in the 1400s, that's what's created. These the breaks up into these three parts. In 1453, the Turks capture Constantinople, which isn't as big of a deal because Constantinople was a wreck, but it gives them an anchor. It anchors them to, it connects their two parts, Europe, Southeastern Europe, and Asia Minor. It gives them an imperial capital. It gives them what they didn't have before, which was respect. They had a real city. Like, Egypt is rich. Egypt has a Nile. It's a real country. It's old. Baghdad is Baghdad. Baghdad is the largest Islamic city in the world. How do you compete with that? Well, you got to get your own. You got to get your own city. If you don't have a giant river, which Asia Minor doesn't, you're going to need to have a big city. And so they capture Constantinople. In 1516, the Turks capture Egypt and Damascus. So they capture um, their Syrian competition and then capture, invade, and capture Egypt. In 1534, they march down the Tigris and the Euphrates and capture Baghdad, which had been sacked in 1258. And so it wasn't really in this competition, so you could let it go. So Egypt, you to capture Baghdad, you smash Egypt first and then go back up, go down the coast, go down the river, capture Baghdad. It's not important since it's not important. What that does is by 1534 leaves the Turks having united the Islamic world. They're not Arabs. And that's going to be a big deal. But the caliph, the caliphate will be in Constantinople, not in Baghdad, not in Mecca. It will not be an Arab. It will be a Turk. And so it's the Islamic world is ruled by a converted people, a nomadic people who have settled down in Asia Minor. That's a little embarrassing if you're an Arab. It's good if you're a Muslim. If you're a Muslim, the Islamic world is now unified again. It's strong again. It has a leader again. But if you're an Arab, you look at this and go, wow, why do these guys get to run the show? We're the chosen people. Muhammad was an Arab. Muhammad wasn't a Turk. And so there's an embarrassment, a humiliation that's always attached to this that Europeans will use in 1917, T.E. Lawrence and Europeans, British during the First World War, to break the Arab world away from the Islamic world, from the Islamic world, they are Islamic, from the Turkish world, to break up the Turkish Empire. Three, Jerusalem becomes a holy city. And the goal of the Islamic conquest was to regain it and to retain it. And they will retain it until uh, basically the British leave and the um, Israeli war for independence in the 1940s. And only then does it stop being really an Islamic city. Uh, East Jerusalem still today, in, in 2017, is still Islamic. So, um, and the thought is, if there's ever going to be a Palestinian country, that East Jerusalem will be part of their capital. That the West Bank is still majority Islamic, Muslim people. Um, even as late as 1900, less than 10% of the people in Palestine were Jews, were Hebrews. And so Jerusalem has this effect that it's an important city. It's, it's why there is the wars between the, the Arab, what, what, uh, when I was a kid, we called them the Arab-Israeli wars, the, the five wars, four wars, five wars, 48, 56, 68, and 72. One, two, three, four plus then the intifadas, the, the wars, uh, the, the, the terrorism, Hezbollah, Hamas, and the uprisings of Palest Muslim Palestinians in the late 70s and the 80s into the 90s. Um, 
part of it is a lot of it is political. Some of it is economic, but there's always this idea that Jerusalem is ours. Jerusalem should be ours. That Jerusalem is an Islamic city. For the Byzantine Empire, the Crusades are a disaster. It leads them to be weaker. Eventually, they're abandoned by the West. They're seen as some, some decadent, sick cousin that no one likes. There is no union between Catholics and Orthodox. There's no unity. Without that, there's no unity in Europe. And the idea of a unified Roman Empire will never happen again. There was always this dream after the Battle of Adrianople, when, when the Roman Empire cracked into two, there's always the idea that it should come back together. Justinian had that dream. Charlemagne had that dream. There was always this dream that Europe should be unified. The Mediterranean world should be unified like the Romans. It will never happen after this, after 1204. That religion and culture just divides the East and the West too much. And... A, and Europe has never been unified again. The closest we've got is, is now what we call, quote unquote, Europe, the EU, the European Union, that people who I know, friends of mine who, are, who live in the EU call it Europe. Are you part of Europe? I'm in Europe. I live in Europe. When they talk about Europe, they don't mean the parts of Europe that aren't like Turkey or they don't mean the parts that aren't part of the EU. So, so there's an attempt to, to unify Europe again, but not re but, uh, but the EU is really an economic unity. It doesn't have a political unity. That's why Brexit is leaving. That's why the British want to leave. So with no money, the Byzantine Empire had no defense versus the Turks. They lose their empire. They lose their trade. And with that, they lose their cultural importance. And they are swept off of history, sadly. Dramatically, but sadly. More warfare in Western Europe. We have more warfare between European kings and their lords. The kings become more powerful as this time goes on because they're able to levy taxes. And some of these taxes were levied so that they could go on crusade. They're able to levy taxes. With taxes come armies, plus the industry to support those armies. Those armies are then turned on their lords. Oh, you want to fight against me? Look at what I got. I took this army to the Middle East. I got it bloodied up. I got it experienced. And now I'm going to use it against you, lords. They defeat the lords and they create powerful states. This is especially true in France. It's a little less true in Germany. You don't get a unified Germany, but the emperor of Germany does become very powerful in the Middle Ages. The 12, 13, 1400s. The first crusade, and we see this conversion. The first crusade was led by lords. There's no kings on that crusade. It's lords with their retinues, with their homeboys. And what it had was loyalty and enthusiasm. It had no leader. It was much more democratic. Now it fractured. The Normans went off and did their own thing. Other people stopped at Antioch. Other people went on to Jerusalem. And it had maybe 15,000 total knights and officers. The third crusade, the one to get back, the All-Star Crusade, the Crusade of the Three Kings, was three kings with paid armies. They were kingly armies. They weren't rich guys going on their own. These were kingly armies, and they brought with them size and power. The Barbarossa had 20,000 knights of his own. Richard had 10,000 knights. Philip had probably 2,500 knights. You could see that Philip, even though he's the king of France, wasn't a strong king. He couldn't get that many lords to go with him. The kings of France will become stronger, beat up their nobility. But Richard could get 10,000 knights. Barbarossa, though, could get 20,000 knights. That's more knights. That's double the knights of the entire First Crusade. So the future is in kings. And when we take History 102, we'll see the development of states. We'll see kingly armies. We'll see infantry. We'll see a world at war. 
that will eventually end um, in 1848 with the coming of communism, coming of democracy, coming of uh, liberalism, and the idea that kings don't really get to run the show anymore. The French Revolution kind of knocks it in its, in its knees, but there is a period from 1815 to 1848 where conservatism makes a comeback. But that's in History 102. What about it for Italy? For Venice and Genoa, they got rich. They got stupid wealthy. They get rich on the transport of crusaders. They're going to build boats to ship crusaders and their horses. With those navies, they now have trade because I have a boat. And if it's not going to be full of people, I'll make it full of stuff. So Middle Eastern trade, instead of going to Constantinople and from Constantinople to Europe, will instead go to Lebanon. And from the Lebanon cities, which were always major trade cities ever since ancient Egypt, they are always major trade cities. The Phoenician cities will get on Italian boats and from Italian boats, they will go back to Italy, to Venice, to Genoa, eventually to Florence. Those navies will dominate the Mediterranean. Those navies will protect trade. Those navies are going to make them rich so that Venice and Genoa and the other trade cities of Italy are going to get rich on the exotic trade, on the Silk Road trade, on the Mongolian trade. Notice who Christopher Columbus is. Notice who Marco Polo are. These are Italians from Genoa. Marco Polo is going to go all the way to China. He's going to take Italian boats to the Middle East, and then he's going to walk on the Mongol conquered roads all the way to China. And then be in charge, not be in charge, um, work with Kublai Khan in China for 10 years or so, and then come back. Well, if he could do that, trade will do that. And so they replaced the Byzantine Empire. This is especially true after the Byzantine Empire is looted in 1204. The, the Vienna, not Vienna, Venice knocked off one of its rivals like a good mafioso boss does. Its rival was Constantinople. It knocked the knees out of it using the crusade. And what will come west is money. All of that money, but also Byzantine knowledge. As Byzantines flee the dying Byzantine Empire, they'll go to Italy. It's the most culturally similar. It's still the most advanced place. It's the easiest to get to. And that Byzantine knowledge of Aristotle, of Plato, of Socrates, <coughs> of Euclid, of Aeschylus, of Sophocles, all of that, plus the money to build universities and schools, will create the Renaissance, which will be our next topic. And so Venice and Genoa dominate the Middle Eastern trade, get rich, create, and are at the forefront of using that money to create the cultural revolution that is the Renaissance.